uh, guest tonight, uh, and Andy, I'll call him Andy Benfield, um, who, when I first met him many years ago in Myanmar, uh, I thought was a very um, straight-laced economic and aid consultant working with the EU delegation. And in fact, little did I know Andy had a secret life which uh, involved all kinds of things, including uh, getting on an old motorbike and riding from India through Nepal, Bhutan and over to um, uh, Myanmar and uh, um, uh, sort of setting up houses in, in Bali and all kinds of other things. He can tell you a bit more about all that. He's got uh, photos and video and uh, um, I think some highly entertaining stories. So uh, without any further delay, Andy, over to you. Do your stuff and we can have questions afterwards. And the book is on sale for a very modest 400 baht and the author is here to sign it. So if you want a rollicking read, I suggest uh, that uh, you can pick up a book later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to Gwen for really generously hosting and to the FCCT. And um, yeah, from what I hear, there's, there, there's quite a lot of competition for what you could be doing on a Friday night in Bangkok. So thank you very much for, for coming here. Um, I was next going to say that if I sound a little hoarse and look a little tired, it's because I was at a, a wedding reception last night, and there is someone there who can, who can uh, back that up. Uh, and I was going to thank the happy couple because they had promised that instead of going on their honeymoon, they were going to turn up here this evening. But I see they're not actually here yet, so I, I guess I can't blame them too much. Um, so I'm here to tell you about my book, The Wrong Way Around, uh, How Not to Travel to Burma by Motorcycle. So. Ostensibly, it's uh, the story of a trip I took from uh, Delhi in India to uh, Rangoon in Burma, or Yangon in Myanmar, if you, if you prefer the newer names. It's the adventures and the mishaps along the way, because I'm, I'm basically a straight-laced economic and political consultant who had no idea how to uh, do this and was very unprepared. Um, and there's also some reflections on the politics and culture and, and conflicts of the, the region. Um, well, that's what I told Gwen, because otherwise she wouldn't let me do the launch at the FCCT. But, um, the other thing that's in it, which you can kind of see from the cover, uh, which was kind of a bit of a debate whether to write about this, was that I did it with a, a traveling uh, companion. And it's about the kind of uh, breakdown in relationship between me and my traveling companion who was kind of the polar opposite of me in that she's a very intelligent, basically fearless uh, European aristocrat, which are three things that I'm not. And she was also my girlfriend, uh, at least uh, at the time that the, uh, the journey uh, started. Um, okay. So, which way round? The plan was basically start up in here, uh, in Delhi, go east for about... Uh, what is that, 2,500K, uh, then take a right and go down into Burma. So what could possibly go wrong? And to do it on one of these uh, motorbikes, and it's not just any motorbike, this is a, a Royal Enfield uh, Bullet, and it's actually the, the longest, I think it, no, it's the oldest motorbike design that has kind of not been changed in the world. So they started uh, knocking them out in, it says here, 1901. It was a British company, uh, and then they teamed up at one point with a firm in Madras in India and started producing them there. And then the Indian army and police said, this is ideal, this is what we need uh, for going around on in India, particularly in the, in the border regions. And today, if you go to India, you know, you can find them kind of chugging along the highways and byways, piloted by everyone from khaki-clad cops uh, to turbaned young Sikhs, uh, to I guess anyone who wants a little bit of, of Bollywood machismo in their life. And I, I first went to India 15 years ago, and I kind of I fell in love with this bike. And I guess there were three, three reasons. One is that, to me, it looks like something that, uh, for the older members of the audience, that like Steve McQueen would ride out of a World War II prison camp on. Second, the slogan of the company is, goes like a bullet made like a gun. And 
Thirdly, Enfield rhymes very conveniently with my last name, Benfield. So I had a thought that if I got one, maybe people would call me Benfield on the Enfield, uh, or even just the Royal Benfield. Um, did, didn't actually happen, but I had two issues. One was that I didn't know how to ride motorbikes and, uh, when I went to India, and the other was that I was absolutely terrified of the uh, Delhi traffic. Uh, but then I met people like this, who were also supposed to be here, but late, uh, and they're two of my friends from India who convinced me uh, to finally get on a bike uh, and kind of quite nervously I, uh, I eventually did. So fast forward uh, about 10 years, I was living in Rangoon, I thought this would be perfect to have one of these bikes to go around Burma on and a bit boring to ship it in so you know why not just drive it over, uh, how, hard can it, uh, how hard can it be? Started in lovely... Uh, crazy Delhi. And as I write in the book, I mean, Delhi's always a bit hard to pin down, you know, because anything you say about it, the opposite is kind of also true. You're kind of, you know, you're driving through, there's a Sikh temple next to a new shopping mall, there's a bicycle rickshaw being overtaken by a Mercedes S-Class, uh, there's a businesswoman on her iPhone walking next to a holy man who's barefoot, kind of carrying a trident. Um, so, yeah, whatever you say about it, the opposite tends to be proved uh, right a little bit later. So as we're driving through, you know, you, it feels rich, it feels poor, it feels quite materialistic now, Delhi, but it still feels fairly spiritual. It feels kind of timeless, but it's also changing at a breakneck uh, speed. And that, for me, means that, I mean, Delhi and India in general, I find myself kind of in love with it at one minute, kind of despising it the next. Uh, sometimes laughing, sometimes crying uh, in the space of the same afternoon, but kind of never bored. I think that's the one great thing about Incredible India. So from there, we carried on down to uh, the Taj Mahal, as my, uh, my partner insisted on, on seeing this great monument uh, to love. Uh, I thought maybe it would be a good omen for our relationship uh, along the trip. Uh, that didn't quite happen. Uh, then it got a bit more interesting, so heading up here uh, through uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, or UP as they call it. And this is a place that I guess not a lot of tourists go to. It's, uh, it's India's most populous state, so you've got 200 million people there. If, if, if it was a country, it would be the sixth largest uh, in the world. Um, so you do stick out, as you can see there. Um, it's had half of India's prime ministers come from Uttar Pradesh. It doesn't seem to have had kind of any of the, the patronage you might, have, you might have expected. So the infrastructure is pretty poor, uh, and it's a kind of hard scrabble place. It has 15% of the Indian population, but 30% of Indian crime is committed there, and 50% of shootings uh, happen there. So fairly, fairly vigilant as you're driving along and kind of sticking out uh, quite a lot. After that, cross the border into uh, beautiful Nepal. But at first, that, that southern area of Nepal, which, uh, again, not a lot of people know, it's called the Terai, and it was one of the areas that was really suffered uh, in the Nepali Civil War. Now, that had ended some time back in, uh, in 2006. But what had happened was the Maoists had fought the monarchy, then the monarchy went away, the monarchy was dissolved, great problem solved. But the monarchy had kind of been keeping the lid on a lot of problems. Uh, they had a law, for example, that all of the hundred ethnicities that live in Nepal, you weren't allowed to talk about differences uh, between them. Uh, so it, it kept the peace to some degree, but when it was like a lid kind of coming off the, a, a pressure cooker. And so since then, in the kind of new Nepal, long delayed constitution, a lot of these groups protesting and fighting for a, a piece of the pie uh, to create a fait accompli before the constitution was agreed, which it now has been. But at that time, which is now a couple of years ago, uh, there was, a, 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 you know, shootings, bombings, protests, as you have this mix of kind of corrupt politicians, business people, uh, people who've been oppressed, whatever, trying to make deals uh, and uh, just kind of up their, up their position before the constitution uh, got approved. So that was another quite interesting place to, uh, to travel through. Then, lovely Kathmandu, a little bit calmer. Um, you have the beautiful old uh, squares and temples and this lovely mix of Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism. 
You also have these guys. So this is a, a Pashupatinath temple in Kathmandu. And they're the sadhus, uh, who are these people who, like these holy men uh, and more rarely women, who you'll see just wandering barefoot around India, often in the middle of nowhere, uh, maybe just wearing a loincloth. And they've basically renounced materialism, they've renounced family life, and they've, you know, they've gone off to, to find uh, spiritual enlightenment. I've always found it fascinating that these guys uh, exist. There's quite a variety in them, and also their, uh, their kind of tailoring choices. Uh, you know, I'm not sure the significance of the different things myself, but one thing a lot of them like to do, and I, th I think the technical term is rolling a fatty here, is, uh, is the cannabis, right? So they, they love skinning up a joint, gets you closer to Shiva, helps with your meditation. Um, so yeah, qu quite an eclectic mix of stuff with these guys. And there you go, two puffs, and you're in Nirvana. From there, we kind of made a detour, and you can't see super well on the map, but there's a finger of India that sticks up between Nepal and Bhutan and kind of tickles the, the underbelly of China, and that's Sikkim. Um, and I urge you to go there if you get the chance. It's actually a, an ancient Buddhist kingdom, so for 300 years it was, uh, it was a separate country. And then when India got its independence in, uh, in 1947, they kind of said, well, why don't you join us? And Sikkim said, well, no thanks, but you can take care of our defense and diplomacy. They said, all right then. Um, and it was not until 1970 three, that the problem with kings is that, you know, sometimes you can get a crazy one, right? And that's, that's what happened. I guess there was too much inbreeding or something. Uh, so there was a lot of rioting, and then they had a referendum, and they ended up uh, joining India. But it never became really Indian, so it's really a world apart and a, and a mix of, I don't know, Tibet and Southeast Asia somehow, a uh, fascinating place. Probably not as fascinating as the, the next bit, which was, uh, which was Bhutan, which is this lovely kind of fairy tale lost uh, magical kingdom uh, sandwiched between China and India. And I'll say a bit more about Bhutan later. So you start realizing just how big India is. And, uh, and I've seen my friend Moona, who I mentioned earlier, the one who introduced me to Royal Enfield Motorcycles, has now arrived. So she does exist. Thank you for coming. And um, yeah, you drive all the way through Nepal you're still in India. You drive all the way through another country, Bhutan, you come out, you're still in India. I mean, you, you know, you start to get a sense now, we've been traveling for weeks in other countries, and we're still back uh, in India. So this was, this first bit is uh, Assam, uh, it's elephants and rhinos and tea estates. Uh, and then there's the much more dodgiest, the much more dodgier bit, which is Northeast India. And we could have done this in a much nicer way, just coming down here. But my traveling companion, of course, insisted we go through the kind of wildest and most dangerous part, because otherwise we weren't, uh, we weren't proper adventurers. Um, from there, there's something called the Highway of Sorrows, uh, which I'll tell you why it's called that in a minute, which takes you to the, uh, to the Burmese border. So that's traveling through, uh, through Nagaland, and the hills. Lovely local hotel there. Um, then it was across the border into Western Burma, uh, and at that time, it was just before election, so a kind of, a lot of feeling of, of hope, but also nervousness of what was happening. Were the Tatmadaw, the army, finally gonna really give up uh, rule after, after over 50 years? Uh, through to Napidor, if you haven't been there, it's worth a visit, the crazy Burmese capital. They moved it up from Rangoon to Napidor. Uh, who made that, who said that saying, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. I mean, they kind of haven't yet, but there's an 18-lane highway ready for, uh, for when they do. Uh, it's improved a bit since then, but it's, it's, still, it's still a pretty weird and empty place. Uh, and then basically down towards uh, lovely Rangoon. So that was the route, more or less. Um, as for the roads, you get, you get a little bit obsessed with roads doing a trip like this because they kind of make or break your day and they can be the cause of great happiness or despair. This is what they did not look like. Uh, this is a rarity. This is the road from uh, Delhi going down to the Taj Mahal. And I think apart from that and the 18-lane highway in Napidor, uh, yeah, it was far more like this kind of thing was the norm. Uh, or this, lots of unsecured uh, drop-offs. Or sometimes I felt the, uh, 
the map makers had maybe contracted that Chinese virus. Not, not, the, not that one, the corona one, but the, um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative thing, where the belt thing means the road, and the road thing actually refers to the maritime route. I mean, this is what this felt like. I mean, this, this is nominated as a road, and it's basically uh, a river. There's a lot of, there is movement. I mean, one of the reasons for the trip was it's an area that's been cut off for many years because the, you know, the roads uh, stop at, at Burma. But now there's a lot of construction, a lot of infrastructure being built, which is actually not very convenient when you're driving because they kind of just take everything off. And I was attacked twice by large earth-moving equipment uh, during the trip because they'll basically be up here tossing down debris across the road, not looking what they're doing. You think they've kind of seen you, they haven't, and you, you get a shower of uh, mud on top of you. So all that means you really shouldn't drive at night. That's very, very stupid. Uh, there's a lot of potholes. There's no street lights. There's livestock coming into the road. There's people coming into the road. And the other people driving at night tend to be long distance bus and truck drivers. They're trying to get to their destination quite fast. And they're staying awake with a variety of kind of legal and some less legal stimulants. So they're not, not the best guys to, uh, to meet. But because, yeah, a lack of decent preparation, uh, not really knowing what the roads were like, a lot of the times you get delayed and bang, this was going up from uh, Pokhara to Kathmandu. I think it was one of the, the scariest uh, experiences of, of, of the trip, trying to, uh, trying to do that in the middle of the night. And I, I can't talk about roads without finishing with something about the fantastic Indian Border Roads Organization. And these guys maintain all the toughest roads, not just in India, but also across the border. They build the roads, some of the roads in Nepal, near the border in Bhutan and, and Burma. And they have this wonderful line in uh, road safety signs, which kind of combines this Indian love of, of puns and playing with the English language and kind of witty aphorisms. So you get things like this one, it is not rally, enjoy the valley, fantastic. A great one for any foreign correspondents here, in here tonight, after whiskey, driving risky. And then there's a few that are a little more, a little more racy, there's the be soft on my curves, quite nice. Uh, darling, I like you, but not so fast. And then I'm sorry for the next one, it's frankly quite outrageous, but I, I, I've included it anyway. Don't gossip, let him drive. <laughs> so that's the Indian Border Roads Organization. Before I talk about a couple more uh, things about culture and conflict and stuff like that, we're just going to show a little video and a kind of view uh, from the saddle of the trip to give you a flavor. So I think we're going to roll that. Yep, thank you. So we seek Andy's blessings for his trip to India, to Nepal, and to Myanmar, and to Bhutan. So he has a wonderful <laughs> time ahead of him, and he enjoys his journey in safe hands with the blessings of God. I'm not 
रहना मस्त खराबा नाम शादी ना गम ना की नाम पली की पाकी नाम अभी नाम काकी नाम आकाश नाम There you go. That's a bit of a, a view of what it looked like. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> actually, all of the worst bits are kind of we didn't film because we were kind of too petrified at the time just trying to stay alive. So um, that was the satellite view. Um, of course, the culture of the places is one of the reasons you, you do it right. And um, there's lots about that in, in the book. I just picked out uh, one place, which is, which is Bhutan. Uh, the local name for the country is the Kingdom of the Thunder Dragon, so you, you've kind of got to love it straight away. Um, and there's a lot of places you go to, you think, if you've traveled a bit, you think they're going to be pretty different, uh, quite exotic, and they're never quite as impressive as you think, and it's a bit like somewhere else you knew. But Bhutan, it's really not. I mean, it's really out there. Um, it's less than a million people, sandwiched there between China and India, stuck in the middle. And it's a country that came up with the concept of gross national happiness instead of, me instead of measuring gross national product. It's a country uh, where you're not supposed to cut down any tree without permission or uh, kill any animal to eat. And it's also a country where an entire national park in the east has been dedicated officially by the government for the protection of the yeti. So, I mean, what is, what is not to like with a place like this, right? So as you can imagine, uh, there's a very rich culture, there's great dances, there's great mandalas, and there's this blend of Bon, the, uh, the folkloric uh, or the folk mountain religion that predates Tibetan Buddhism uh, with Tibetan Buddhism. There's also something else quite prominent, and I must apologize to Gwen for kind of lowering the tone slightly of the FCCT, but I can't talk about Bhutan without mentioning the Bhutanese cult of the phallus. Um, the penises are everywhere, okay? This is, this is a normal shop and bar, okay? Maybe 50% of the buildings in Bhutan, you're like, what is going on? This stuff is painted on every one. So after the first couple of days, and you're sure it is what you think it is, you start asking around, like, what is, what is going on here? Is this, is this place full of perverts? It's actually due to a chap uh, called the Divine Madman, also known as Drukpa Kunli. And he was a 15th century wandering holy man. And his take on the kind of Buddhist maxim of you've got to free yourself from desire was like, well, don't, don't resist stuff you want, but just kind of go through it, do it, and, and don't get too attached. He then proceeded to kind of uh, drink and fornicate his way across the country and became uh, quite famous. And according to the, uh, the stories, he... Uh, got rid of a lot of nasty mountain spirits, and also enlightened several hundred uh, people using his diamond thunderbolt uh, of flaming wisdom, which was also known as his penis. And thus the cult of the Bhutanese protective phallus was born. So you see them everywhere protecting, protecting buildings. People take it very seriously. It's not a joking matter. But sometimes I have to show one more picture because... Um, there's just a lovely juxtaposition of a painting of a sign on the next photo, I think. And it's not intentional. In South Asia, if you have an establishment that is offering both fooding, 
and drinking, as they say, right? Uh, you will call it a restaurant cum bar, which I just think is a particularly nice uh, composition there. So, I, moving on, I'm so sorry for that, Gwen. Essential part of Bhutanese culture. Um, so this is all very nice. People are in traditional dress. You're thinking this is beautiful. The buildings are, are, are traditional. Everything is in Bhutanese style. Even the road signs there, you know, you've got someone in Bhutanese dress. I mean, they've really gone to town. But then there was a, like a darker side of it as well. And this is an art school in, in Timpu, the diminutive uh, capital of Bhutan. And these guys are doing these amazing paintings and sculptures, but they're doing them from a like engineering blueprint that dictates like the exact curve of the Buddha's cheekbone uh, or the distance between the, the bracelets on a goddess's uh, arm. And it's not just in the art school. Uh, it's about dress. It's about how buildings are constructed. Um, and it's interesting. It's like they're trying to kind of bottle and freeze their culture. I think the worrying thing kind of about that is if they'd been doing that a couple of hundred years ago, a lot of this stuff never would have come in uh, anyway. So you've, you've, you've had this incredibly rich and creative society uh, that now is being a little bit uh, frozen in time. I think most foreigners go there and they love it. They say, this is amazing. But then you ask them, what, what would you say if your government said you can only build your house in the traditional you know, British style or you, you have to always wear a three-piece suit, this kind of thing. So it's like cultural theme parks that... They're all very well, uh, you know, if you don't have to actually uh, live in one, right? We could argue that point, but what is more sinister? Um, so, and I, I don't have a photo, I wasn't able to photograph it, but we were rounding a corner one day, and not only Bhutanese are immaculately turned out like this, and you just get used to them, very, very smart and immaculately dressed. And there were some road workers there, like, you know, wearing tattered rags, blackened faces, uh, didn't look in a good way. And so we're asking around, and you know, people were saying, oh, no, they're Bhutanese, but not the real Bhutanese. Well, what, what does that mean? And so there's a, a group of ethnic Nepalese who've been living in southern uh, Bhutan for, uh, for generations. But in the 90s, the government had this policy of Bhutanization and was like, this is the language you're going to speak. This is how you're going to dress. Uh, these are even guidelines for eating. And these guys, these ethnic Nepalese, said, well, look, that's... that's not us, you know, that's not where we come from, and that's kind of quite oppressive. So they, they started protesting. 100,000 of them had their citizenship stripped. Uh, thousands of others left, and the ones that stayed couldn't get decent jobs anymore and, and were doing things like the, the very tough uh, road working. So it was a, a kind of, yeah, this, this dirty little secret and like the definition of gross national happiness has quite a narrow, uh, a narrow focus of, of national. Um, back to something a bit lighter. Borders. Uh, so we had to cross uh, five of them. Um, and if you've not particularly done your preparation, well, there's something called a carnet de passage, apparently, which is a piece of paper you have, and then you can get across the border, and it's all fine. Uh, we didn't have one of them. So the theory was we'll just try and maybe bribe our way across or whatever. Interestingly, they didn't even say anything about the motorbike for three of the borders. It was fine. This one is the India-Nepal border, uh, which crazily was not even kind of signposted. You're ridiculously and feeling very amateurish, kind of asking people, you know, which way is Nepal and, and taking the wrong direction. No road signs. And it wasn't the main border point, but we, we got there and there were two chaps kind of reading the paper, drinking coffee, didn't seem quite sure what to do, eventually processed the papers, and then very memorably said, uh, oh, you can, you can see yourself out, meaning that we could just like, raise the barrier ourselves and, and drive out of the country. So it was quite quaint. And on the other side, in Nepal, we couldn't find the immigration office for about an hour. It was across a field down a track somewhere. Had to wake this chap up in his vest and persuade him to stamp our passports. So it was, it was interesting. It was, you know, it was, uh, some of them were better. This is the entrance into Bhutan, very grand. But the best one, the best border, I think, was going into Myanmar. And basically, foreigners aren't allowed across, which is why no one has really done this, this trip. Um, some guys did it in the 50s, in Land Rovers. Since then, it's become very difficult, or you'd need a kind of escort across Burma, something like that. But to do it as an independent traveler, 
uh, was tough. So we'd applied for a special permission from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we'd been told just two days before we arrived there, oh, you can cross the border, special permission granted, fantastic, but only one person and one motorbike, which gave a bit of a problem as we were two people and one motorbike. So we came across this beautiful iron bridge uh, into Burma uh, and then, rather amazingly, managed to convince uh, the border staff that we were married and because we were married, we were kind of one person in the, in the eyes of God and the Buddha. And uh, they, the phones didn't work, so they couldn't phone Naked or to check. And they actually let us in and then we kind of hot-footed it uh, away from the border post uh, as fast as possible. So, yeah. Guys with guns, and it was mainly guys, uh, were quite a big theme. Um, above all, in, in northeast India. And I think, you know, many people don't even realize this bit of India exists. You know, they know this part, and then they think, oh, well, there's Bangladesh and uh, Bhutan and Burma. But there's something like chicken's neck here, which leads off from mainland India into this whole very different part of the world that doesn't seem Indian at all when you go there. I mean, the people look different, they speak different languages, they dress differently. Um, I think a lot, of them, a lot of them do wonder how they got attached to what they refer to as the mainland in the first place. And a lot of them have taken action about that. There's now 70, 70 uh, active militant groups in the Northeast, uh, looking, some of them for complete independence, some of them for some degree of autonomy or self-rule. Um, when we went to, we started off in Delhi, and we were, I particularly was petrified of this area. Uh, and so we went to the local office of uh, uh, Nagaland and Manipur, two of the, the most dodgy states in Delhi, to check on the security situation. And we kind of walked into the office, woke the guy up, and uh, said, well, can you give us some advice? You're the official government representative for this area. And he said, um, well, you've, you've got an armed escort, right? Ah, uh, no, I forgot. Forgot to pack that one, sorry. Don't have that. He just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you know, best of luck. Um, so it was, quite, it was quite worrying, I must say, driving through there. Um, there's a lot of military about. I mean, it's really, it's really teeming with them. And there's a lot of military communication as well. Indian Army, no better friend, no worse enemy. Nice and direct. Just kind of driving along and trembling even more. But the Gurkhas, the Gurkhas are even more direct. You know, the Gurkhas are these, these kind of legendary Nepali fighters who are now used by other armies around the world, including the Indians and the Brits. Uh, so they just have a sign saying, Gurkha, blood and guts, and that's it, outside their, outside their camp, which is just, right, right let's, let's accelerate. There are some, there's some effort to win, heart, to win hearts and minds up there. So you get these signs saying, Army's your friend, or, you know, just after the blood and guts one or army is friend of the hill people, but what you can't see in that photo is there are like two machine gun nests either side of that, which kind of, you know, diminishes the message uh, a little bit. And it's not normal army up there. It's paramilitaries. It's the Assam rifles, mainly. There's so many things in this region when you travel through and people tell you the difficulties they have and the problems that actually stem back to the bloody British. I can say that as I'm British myself, but it's, it's shameful and embarrassing. Um, the Assam Rifles is one of them. This group was set up back in the day when the Brits struggled in northeast India to uh, contain tribal raiding. Uh, and there's a lot of head hunting going there. The Brits lost a lot of heads back in the day. So they set up the Assam Rifles. And they also gave them something called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Uh, and that came in, I think, in 42 when you had the Quit India Movement. And they were looking for a way to kind of give carte blanche to these guys to arrest people, shoot on sight, whatever. Uh, in what they call disturbed areas. And today, uh, most of the Northeast is still uh, nominated as, 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 as that. So, yeah, you're seeing them everywhere. Uh, there's some towns like Imphal, the nearest town to the Burmese border, which really feels like it's under military occupation. It did at that time. Anyway, there's uh, armored personnel carriers in the streets. There's, you know, uh, sandbagged emplacements on corners. There's snipers on roofs. Um, Overall, this policy, I mean, it doesn't seem to have worked terribly well. There doesn't seem to have been a lot of investment in jobs and infrastructure and these kind of things. And at least the people we met, you know, they, they seemed even more alienated from the, from the mainland. Um, 
Maybe that's going to change now. India, Modi is doing his Act East policy. He had the Look East one. We looked for a bit. Now we're acting. Uh, they want to open up the trade routes to Burma. Uh, they want to exploit things there. So, so maybe they, they're going to invest a bit more. I don't know. The, um, yeah, so basically reading the paper was quite a scary experience. So I, would, I was trying to calm myself down and say it's not that bad. And then you'd pick the paper up and it would be kind of, you know, bombing, shootings, ambushes mainly on the route you were taking the next day. Uh, so it's a little bit of a nervous wreck. You see the militant groups that are there, and there are lots of them. Um, it's almost this kind of Monty Python-esque thing that you'd, you'd meet someone and, and uh, you'd, you'd say, oh, I'm, I'm campaigning for a free Bodo land. And you'd say, like, oh, are you from the United Bodo Land Liberation Front then? And they would say, well, absolutely not. I'm, the, I'm from the front for a democratic, liberated Bodo land. You know, those, those first guys are our sworn enemies. So you've got all these fragmented groups who have kind of ended up, uh, you know, fighting themselves as much as they're fighting Delhi. And they're also now, they had their criminal sidelines, uh, extortion, drugs, gun running, to make money for the cause. But a lot of them now seem to be doing that as the main, uh, the main uh, bit of business and uh, the freedom fighting is now the sideline. Um, one interesting thing is the, the meth trade, the methamphetamine, right? So they get the, uh, the cough medicine, which you can bribe the pharmacy in India to get. You take it across the Burmese border, goes up 10 times in price, magically, and then you take it to the far east of Burma, goes into labs, and then the, meth the methamphetamine you know, ends up here. Um, here meaning Thailand, not the, not the FCPT, obviously. <laughs> Um, so, this is on video, right? Um, but sometimes, so there, was, there were scary moments, but there were also other, other moments where you'd get pulled over, you'd get questioned, and the guys would then say, give us what you want, and you can go. And I'd be like, okay, I'm experienced by now, I know what you mean, and you'd go in the pocket for some rupees, take them out, and then they'd look at you and say, no, no, selfie, selfie. So still, you know, the power of Instagram is kind of penetrating and, and making travel, uh, travel self safer as they'd rather have a photo than, um, than some cash, at least some of them. Um, I know nothing about motorcycles. I think they look nice. I can just about ride one. I have no idea how to maintain one. And we did this not on a sensible off-road bike, but on, uh, on a Royal Enfield, which breaks down uh, quite a lot. So this was a common theme. Some things even I knew were wrong when that bit came off. Um, you know, uh, yeah, this is, this is a problem. Um, but it could get, I mean, sometimes that's fine. You break down. There's lots of people around who know these bikes, especially in India. They help you. Other times it's quite scary. The brakes go when you're going down a mountain or you just get stuck out in the middle of nowhere uh, overnight. Um, and, yeah, if you don't have a second vehicle, what are you going to do? But one thing that is amazing in India, not only the ability to fix an Enfield, is also there's this kind of, let's say, what would qualify as roadworthy in other parts of the world. In India, they say, no, 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 that's still OK. You, we'll get you back on the road. You, know, you may think you can't go any further, but we will, we will get this going. I have a nice uh, truck that we overtook, which demonstrates this. So this guy is moving down the road. And I saw him at first in the rearview mirror and thought, oh my god, I mean, there's been a crash, the accelerator's got jammed, you know, this, this, this vehicle is out of control. But actually, he wasn't. He was quite happily driving along, and it was all <laughs> secured with this rope, no problem at all. He was, uh, he was good to go. So, yeah, look at you, no back brake. What's the problem, mate? It's okay. Um, so, lastly, what I would say is, you know, a big theme of the book is... Uh, we were very unprepared, and we shouldn't have made it, really. I'm ruining the ending by telling you that we did. We, we, we got there. Um, I was very scared we couldn't do it alone. We didn't do it alone. We were saved by everyone from policemen to priests to farmers to villagers. Uh, Father John here sorted out our suspension one day with a, a couple of very unchristian like kicks and a, and a big rock, but he got us back on the road. God bless him. Uh, this whole Naga village took us in. We got stuck out after an absolutely appalling uh, day, and we were told it was nine hours to get to where we could find the next place to stay for the night. It was already sunset, quite a dangerous area, a lot of militant groups around, plus the Assam rifles. They took us into their house, cooked us dinner, uh, gave us a bed for the night. Absolutely uh, amazing. 
And then these biker gangs, local biker gangs and clubs who would just come out and like the, the news went down the Bush Telegraph. There's these two crazy foreigners coming. Uh, and they would just turn up and take care of you and, uh, and take you out and stuff. But that could be slightly scary sometimes. So these chaps, we'd just ridden down the Highway of Sorrows, which is supposed to be the quite, well, it is the quite dangerous road you take down through northeast India to get to the border. And the day before, there had been an ambush of a bus uh, so I thought we, we left early on a Sunday morning in the end because you thought surely the bad guys are going to be asleep in bed after all the, all the debauchery of Saturday night. And we just got down the Highway of Sorrows. We got into Impal, which we were told just go to the hotel, don't go out. Very dodgy at the moment, very dangerous. I'm driving into the outskirts and then hearing this horning behind me and looking around I see one quite rough guy on a motorcycle. The other side there's another one, then there's five of them. And kind of thinking, you know, you're about to get robbed or kidnapped. And then they're just kind of looking over and say, oh, Mr. Andy, Mr. Andy, who are you? And they've found out from someone 100 miles away who's phoned them. And they've, they've come to, uh, to kind of pick you up and, uh, you know, and kind of take you to the hotel. I remember when we checked in and we were kind of surrounded by, you know, six members of a motorcycle gang. I think they kind of thought we'd been kidnapped or were there under duress or something. But... Um, but these guys are amazing. They actually, they're like the, the antithesis to the Hells Angels. They spend their time filling in gaps left by the state. And these guys spend their weekends running medicines to remote villages, uh, doing charity runs, saving up money, uh, getting hospitals built, this kind of thing. So they're absolutely amazing. And it's really, you know, I mean, that's a, a key theme of, of the book, that these are beautiful places. Some of them are quite inhospitable. Some of them are a bit dangerous. But uh, it definitely, this trip kind of restored my faith um, in humanity overall. So I shall leave it there, and thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. I think we can all agree that we've, and we almost, well, we didn't quite feel we were there on the bike with you. Uh, but uh, you gave us a really good feeling, I think, for some of the... Uh, the challenges and uh, some of the, the good points. Um, perhaps uh, there's a couple of things perhaps I'd, I'd like to ask you and then we'll turn it over to the floor for questions. But I think one thing you didn't really tell us is why, you know, you've had a varied life and you had a good job as a consultant doing all kinds of things like that. Why did you do this? Why did I do this? Apart from I to impress your girlfriend, which is what you put in the blurb, yeah, so there was, there was definitely a bit of that. That I clearly mean, didn't work. <laughs> this, is, this is like therapy, but slightly harsher. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to get the bike across. I, I thought this is a fantastic route, and it's one that's not the same even now, right? Because when Burma's now opened up, stuff is changing so fast in that part of the world. So I thought it was a really interesting time to, to kind of do that. I mean, I don't like the phrase midlife crisis, but it was kind of... It was a long time since I traveled without a hotel reservation or a, someone putting their chicken in my lap or something like that. So it was like, no, I, I, if I don't do this now, I think I'm, I'm going to end up just on saga holidays and right. going on cruise right. ships and stuff. But also, yes, I thought, how better to cement a relationship with someone who was a little bit, always seemed a little bit out of my grasp, even though we were together, than take them on a two-month motorcycle right. trip across, yeah. Well, South bad Asia. idea. <laughs> bad, don't do it, yeah. That's well, but advice. was it a good idea in the end? It sounds like you enjoyed it, did you? I, I enjoyed the trip, and it was very educational, but it, if, if you don't know if you get on with someone, don't do a two-month motorcycle trip to work it out. So would you do such a trip again, with or without? I would, I would do it. I'd probably choose my travelling companion differently, prepare a little bit more, um, and maybe take a second vehicle and allow a lot more time, I think, as well, yeah. Well, that's good advice for anyone who's uh, planning something that rash. Uh, why did you call it the wrong way round? So this was, have, have any of you heard of The Long Way Round by Ewan McGregor, the Hollywood actor? So he took some time off a few years ago and rode around the world on a motorbike with his buddy and he called it The Long Way Round, going the long way around the world. And I thought, well, this is kind of like the wrong way around because they did it with lots of preparation and backup vehicles and everything else. I did it, we did it without kind of having a clue. Plus, the other thing was that the, the kind of, you know, the relationship dynamic, that this, this was just not a sensible idea at all. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what was, 
really the most difficult bit from... Uh, it all looks quite difficult, and uh, so I was interested in what you would uh, categorise as the most difficult in terms of perhaps physically cha- challenging or scary or um, other kinds of uh, hardships. Yeah, I think, I mean, just, you know, it's prosaic, but just, just the, the roads, when suddenly the road surface is just like broken rock and then your kind of brake fails and, you, you know, you think you're kind of going over the edge, this kind of thing. There's also the kind of uh, South Asian caste system for vehicles. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So you have it for humans, but also for vehicles. So like a, bi- a bicycle is kind of at the bottom, then there's a motorbike, then there's a car, then there's a bus, then there's a truck. So you're quite low down. And that's fine if you have a little Indian-made Bajaj motorcycle. But if you have a big Enfield, you can't really get out of the way. And trucks just expect you, you're a motorbike. What are you doing? You know, you should, you should be moving now and you, and you can't. So you have these kind of head-on chicken runs where you can't pull off because that's, that's going to be very dangerous as well of, you know, just trying to convince the guys to get out. And you saw on the video the digger that was coming towards me. And he just, they're just like, you're a motorbike, move back. I'm like, I can't physically move this huge machine back. And you see that my partner had already got off and was filming it, which was nice at the time. Um, so that was, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite scary. <laughs> I'm glad she was so worried yeah. about you. <laughs> and then I think just the, I mean, some of the military in the Northeast, you're on remote roads, they, they stop you, they're looking at you, and they're, you know, they're saying, oh, you must have a lot of money with you, right? These kind of things. And you're just trying to say things like, well, my embassy, no, I'm here. I know people like Gwen Robinson, whatever, you know, you're throwing names out and, and hoping that they, they kind of back off. But finally, I mean, no, we didn't get robbed. We didn't have to pay many extraordinary, bribes. So, extraordinary. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> did you ever have a moment where you thought, that's it, I'm not going to make it? I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I think there was, there was one where the bike kind of nearly slid off the edge of a precipice where, yeah, there were moments where you think, right, that's, that's not going to happen. And when we were with the Burmese and they were just saying, no, you can only take one person in, the problem was the Indians said, we've never had this situation before because no one crosses this border, but if we let you out of India and across the bridge, you can't come back in because we can't issue visas here. So then when, they, when the Burmese said, well, you can come in, but she can't, it was like, well, she's going to have to stay on the border bridge forever. Forever. Because she thought, no well, at this point... Re- no I wonder mean, she mm. dumped you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a, a joke. <laughs> Keep it light, Quint. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, last question from me, because there's someone waiting there, uh, perhaps, or maybe you're going to ask this, but I would like to say, what's your next... Mm book or adventure? Well, people laugh when now I say this. Now that you've this. done a book. Well, I'm actually now looking for the Yeti. Um, and this comes a bit from this trip that a lot of people kept talking about this. They didn't call it Yeti, but about a bipedal ape-like creature with a human face uh, that lives in the Himalayas. So recently, I've been traveling the very remote areas, nomad camps in northern India, um, in northern Burma and getting some quite interesting stories. And I've been doing it with a friend of mine, Richard, who you know, who's kind of quite serious and intelligent, so quite, you know, like my counterpoint. Uh, and we now have, uh, we have well, a, a TV director and hoping to make a documentary about him and I going to see what's at the bottom of this uh, yet. But are you story. going to do it on a motorbike, or are you going to do it on a... We've done one trip already on a motorbike, but also we'll be walking, Land Rovers, whatever, by any means, I think, and getting up there. And so it'll be a bit about the hunt, because you get to meet a lot of interesting people if you go around saying, I'm looking for the Yeti. I mean, some sane, some less sane. <laughs> There's some nice stories there. Well, maybe we yeah. can schedule a, a, an FCCT evening in two years', in okay. two years time. <laughs> yeah. I'll bring one with me. <laughs> So let's uh, open it up to questions. Please identify yourself. Hi, I, I'm Nick Pilevsky. Um, I think I saw a film about that uh, trip you mentioned in the 50s. And, and of course, they were going to Singapore, as I recall. Um, but listening to your presentation, I've been at least close to most of the places you've talked about. And I had was kind of hoping that you would talk a little bit about what happened once you got over the Burmese border. Because it seems to me in the film, that was the worst part of all, was once they had gotten into Burma, kind of getting into sort of northeast Burma and getting across. Yeah, that uh, actually, so interestingly enough, so it, it was 1956, some Oxford and Cambridge students drove two Land Rovers from London to Singapore. 
And they were the first ones ever to do this, the reason being it was the Burma, crossing from India to Burma was impossible. Uh, but then during the war, the Allies built a road across, and so they were able to take that road. And funny enough, uh, just a couple of months ago, some friends of mine got the original Land Rover and drove it back from Singapore to London. And I accompanied them for the Burma, India, and, uh, and Nepal legs, which was amazing. Um, yeah, the point was also a bit, I mean, Gwen said, you've got two hours. I said, people are going to be terribly bored. So I tried to pick out the main interesting bits. But I appreciate Burma. I've lived in Burma a few years now, so it's quite normal to me. But probably for a lot of people, that's the most interesting part. And it's true, Western Burma, you know, you have uh, a lot of rickety old bridges, um, uh, a lot of up, small maybe. and beautiful towns. Do you want to put the map up? I, yeah, I can put the map up again. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a fascinating area. But we, a we actually did it quite quickly, that last bit of the trip. Um, how can I go back to the beginning? I'm just going to go through super quickly. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. I'll take the next question anyway, I think. I yeah, sure. You can... Uh, uh, so let's have the next question. Please identify yourself. Uh, okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Youssef Aboud. I am a stock analyst and a motorbike rider as well. Um, I have a technical, few technical questions. Oh First, how many cc your bike was? Oh. Uh, num number two is, uh, can you please give us an idea about the paper requirements and the visa requirements, especially to Bhutan? How did you manage mm. to go through all these? So, uh, yes. and, then, and then just one last question. Can you give me an example, like when you were in a remote area and your motorbike was broken, what did you do? Mm. How did you manage to fix it when there's nobody to help you? How did you manage that? I'm interested. Okay, so I, I'm so happy I can answer the technical question. So it was 350 cc. Okay. Bullet. The visas, Indian, Indian Nepal is basically okay. We got up there and just let us across. Nepal back into India, uh, same thing. Bhutan, you have to pre-arrange. You, Before actually, you start a trip, your trip, you mean? Uh, you have to have, so you have to tell them that you're taking your vehicle in, and then they send someone to kind of come along with you. So that's, right. that's not as, well, it's easier, but it's not, as, it's, not as, uh, it's not as fun. And then you need a special or restricted area permit, I think they call it, for northeast uh, India. Now it's easier, and I think you can cross into Burma, but at the time it was a special letter, and I was working for an embassy in, in Burma at the time, so we wrote to the government and managed to get a kind of uh, a special permission. Uh, yeah, for those breakdowns where you don't have a clue how to fix it, I think one of the worst ones was in Sikkim, the little bit of India between Nepal and Bhutan, and it was on a remote mountain road. It cut out. Uh, handily, a cyclone had just hit a few hundred miles south, so it wasn't supposed to rain that time, that, that time of year. It didn't have any rain gear. Uh, so a storm comes in. Uh, it's getting dark. There's no other vehicles on the road. So we basically just thought, we're going to leave the bike and walk. So we left the bike on the mountainside, put on the bag, started walking. A uh, couple of uh, Jeep, well, the kind of Jeep buses they have out there came past. But they're all packed because they don't leave to go anywhere until they're packed. And just a godsend, uh, uh, about, I don't know, 9 o'clock at night, someone came past who had, who had space, and we jumped in the back. They saved us. Then it being India, turned out his brother was a mechanic. So I just handed over the keys to this complete stranger and said, any chance you could go down the mountain, fix the bike, and deliver it to the hotel tomorrow morning? And, and they did. So it was, uh, it was all great. <laughs> Incredible India. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you pay for it? <laughs> I paid royally, yes. <laughs> That's uh, good to hear. So uh, is there uh, anyone else who would like to ask a question? Yes. Indeed. Robin, please uh, identify Kuhlberg yourself. I'm a correspondent here uh, and long-time motorcyclist. I'm enthusiast, I would say. Now, on a scale from 1 to 10, by 10 being the best, 1 being the worst, the aim field probably comes in at 0 0.3. Why on earth did you do it? on an infield. Why did I do it on an infield? Yep. Uh, it's the only bike I know how to ride. It's the only bike I've ever ridden. Uh, so, and I figured, because I don't know how to fix it, if you take some fancy Kawasaki or something, no one's going to have parts. No one's going to be able to fix it. Everyone in India and Nepal and Bhutan, but not in Burma, can fix an infield. Just don't break down in Burma and you'll be okay, was my theory. And we didn't break down in Burma, so... <laughs> But, but the, the Yamaha wouldn't break down, would it? I, I, I know nothing about this. <laughs> You're talking to the wrong guy. But yeah, maybe it would break down a lot less, indeed. <laughs> uh, 
Um, did you oh, want me to sorry. say more about Burma or? Yeah. Say okay. that again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that question was about uh, the Burma yeah. segment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it, it's taken me an incredibly long time to write. So it was the time that, um, you know, you were in that transition phase of kind of election coming up and are the army going to let go or not? Um, by that time, you're kind of, you're out of the mountains, so the, the roads are better. But it's interesting when you cross the border. So the India Border Roads uh, Organization, whose lovely signs I showed earlier, they've actually fixed up all the roads for about 60 kilometers into Burma. The deal being the Burmese do the bridges. The Burmese didn't meet their side of the deal. So you have kind of a decent road and then a kind of 60-year-old Bailey Bridge uh, to get across, which were, which were quite, uh, quite scary at the time. Um, so you come down through this, this kind of rural area, uh, through the town of uh, Monwa. Uh, then you get to uh, Bagan, which is this uh, fairly touristy area now with all the old uh, temples there pass through Napidor, the present capital, uh, and, then, and then kind of take the road down to, uh, to Rangoon. But, um, but there's, there's more about it in the book. That's an invitation to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Should be saying um, that more? <laughs> Please. So my name's Ian. Uh, how exactly does Piglet come into all of this? Mm. Piglet. So... If you look at the front of my book, it's dedicated to Christopher Robbing and Piglet. And if you look at the name of the publishing company, it's called Particular Bear Publishing. And I thought today, I wonder, no one's going to bring this up and ask me because it's going to be hugely embarrassing to talk about. But, but here we are. So since I can remember in my family, my mother has been called Christopher Robin, I've been Winnie the Pooh, and my sister has been called Piglet after the Winnie the Pooh characters. My late father was called Eeyore after the grumpy donkey, but we never told him that that, that was him. Uh, so, in my book, it's dedicated to Christopher Robin and Piglet, which is my mother and sister for being the ones who kind of inspired me to travel. So, it's out now. <laughs> That's just, uh... just going to say that it's actually the 500 acre wood. The 500 the, acre the wood. The real woods, the 500 oh, okay. have acre. I, have I got the, wood, the number of acres wrong in the dedication? No, the, the, real, the, real. the real wood okay. um, is. is it's actually called the 500 acre. 500 acre. In, in the Winnie the Pooh stories, yes. it becomes 100 acre. <laughs> but those, those people who know the true story, you see. Well, okay, obviously, from one Winnie the Pooh fan Found to, to another. another. Yes, it's yeah. Make a club. Yeah. Okay. Why, why not Bangladesh? Mm. What's wrong with tourism? I, what's okay, <laughs> is a big Bangladesh fan because here who would like, like to know why you did not ride <laughs> exactly. through Bangladesh? Why did you avoid Bangladesh? What is your issue are, with are Bangladesh? Are you racist against Bangladesh? That's yes, right. What's I mean, your you, problem you with Bangladesh? You have to pick a route, and I just thought I wanted to go through more mountains. I like the mountains. So next time, Bangladesh. Yeah. That's, that's a, there's, there's several different routes you could do. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Maybe you could show... Wait, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the answer. <laughs> well, I said there's several different routes you could take. I like mountains, so I, I chose the northern route and went for Bhutan instead. But n maybe next time. I'm so sure actually, Bhutan, um, just would be to amazing, clarify, yeah. this next adventure and this mm. on the trail of the Yeti, yeah. in terms of where you went before, where will this adventure take you? Uh, you can, so we've got to get up in the high mountains. So the main stories stand up are there here oh, yeah. in Mustang, uh, kind of northern Nepal. Uh, then, yeah, Bhutan, so trekking up, and particularly, so I was just up in December with my friend Richard, and this is Arunachal Pradesh, which is kind of, yeah, the, the real wild uh, frontier of northeast India, and up in this area, uh, along the border between Tibet, Bhutan, and, uh, and Arunachal Pradesh in India, there's lots of stories, and then about two weeks ago, we were up here in northern Burma, so we're actually the first people to drive from Michina to uh, Putao, which is the furthest north town. We did promptly get arrested and told that we'd violated our visa rules, but then it was kind of too much hassle for them to report it, so thankfully we were, we were set free. But we're told that in this area, just across the border from Burma, um, it will be uh, prime Yeti territory. That's where they are. Sorry. Right. Oh, in Burma? Yeah, so there's right. lots of stories in, uh, in I didn't realise there were Yeti stories in there Burma. There you go, Gwen. I thought you knew everything. No, I oh. didn't know there were Yetis in Burma, but I'm looking forward to you discovering one. <laughs> I think that will be a very good story if you do. Um, but uh, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, that will occupy you for the next couple of years? 
Yeah, that's the, well, that's the next, hopefully, if we make this documentary. And then I'm going to write something on meditation. I just did a 10-day meditation silent retreat in quite a harsh environment in Japan. Uh, so that'll be a bit, bit more of my self-psychological exploration, which I've started in this book, of unpacking my issues there in public. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, maybe that's the subject of another whole <laughs> evening. Um, over to one more question. Uh, Mr. Benfield, I, I read your book. I absolutely Could loved you just it. Introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, my name is Pete Sylvester. Um, I, I was lucky enough to live with uh, in, this, in the same city as Andy for a little while, so we know each other. Uh, and it was a privilege to read your book in your own voice, in your own sense of humour, which is fantastic. And I was just—I know you don't want to do a reading of your book tonight. No, I don't. But there's this one paragraph that made me burst out laughing. I was just wondering if you could do me the pleasure of reading it for me. Go on, Andy. Okay. You're going to give me the page number. Uh, page 170. Oh, uh, not page 117, mate, not that. Uh, halfway down writing. the paragraph, oh, starting God. with the word he. Page 117. 170. Oh, 170. Okay, uh, here we and go. And so in context, it. he was uh, in Bhutan okay. um, yeah. at a family. Okay, so I'm, I'm just, uh, we've got to Bhutan and we're visiting a monastery and we've been invited in. Um, and uh, we've just, the abbot of the monastery has, has taken us in as two foreigners. Uh, how many paragraphs? Where do I start? I finish the whole book from there, or I just... Just the one paragraph. Just the one paragraph. Okay. He motioned for me to kneel down in front of a small shrine, so this is the abbot, and started to rummage inside his robes, emerging triumphantly a few seconds later with a large phallus. An ornamental one, I should add. And then, for the first and quite possibly last time in my life, I was tapped and rubbed on both shoulders with a sizable wooden penis while he wished me long life and prosperity. I then watched benignly as he placed his member onto Lady Rebecca. <laughs> thank you, and thank Pete's you Australian, for that. He loves that uh, stuff. I hope you got a <laughs> kick out of that one. Uh, I can safely say that I think we've There's had more, more sex in, in this talk <laughs> tonight than we have in many months. But so sorry. hopefully, maybe uh, the pad pong night next week may pop that. Yeah, pop that. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. In fact, I, I'm not sure about how many phallus photos we'll have. I think you might have got the award there, Andy. Thank you. So um, uh, I would just like to say, if there are no more questions, ask if you would like to say anything more about uh, the whole... I just thank everyone for coming. And my friends whose wedding reception I was at, uh, uh, who I mentioned at the beginning, oh, are here. Yeah, they right. should be on their honeymoon. Very sadly, they've come to the book launch instead. So thank you. Thank you so much. Like, fantastic. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm happy if anyone wants a, a, a signature. Of course, I can do that. I'm first going to have a gin and tonic. But, uh, you can have several on the house. Thank um, you very much indeed. And uh, I think I might just ask one other question which intrigues me, being a journalist and uh, seeing these areas and you blithely talking about going in and out and saying, well, we might... This area we want to go to is borders, Bhutan, Nep uh, Tibet, uh, Sikkim. These are all incredibly difficult areas to get visas to. So when you said, well, it's okay, you could do it, mm. I, d I don't see how you do it. I know loads of people who've been trying to get into, for example, Tibet is very difficult. Bhutan, they charge this minimum per day, right? Yeah. And you've got to really, to be able to ride in across, I presume you weren't on one of these... $250 a day. No, things. but you're still, you're still so, got to pay. You're still got to pay a lot of money, yeah. yeah, yeah right. But the idea that you can go in and out of Tibet and then over to Bhutan and then even Nepal, I was just there, that's a bit of a hassle. And uh, land crossings, I... Yeah, but if you're in remote areas, then you're not even on roads. So this is, this is for Yeti hunting. There's people there that can... I, they really should not be saying this in public and it's no, being filmed. Not, so it's yeah. absolutely not possible and you shouldn't try and do it. Okay, maybe Don't we come can and cut ask that how, bit for the video. Manage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, there we go. But this man did it, and he is living proof. So Thank you. Thank cheers you to you, much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, please stick around for a drink, and uh, the author's here to sign books or answer questions. Absolutely. Okay, Thank thanks, you. Andy. <laughs>